We look today at Hebrews 12 at verse 18 following, and we have a comparison between the two covenants, the old covenant, the new covenant between, and the imagery here is two mountains, Mount Zion and the New Jerusalem, um, Mount Zion, the New Jerusalem, and uh, from the Old Testament from uh, Mount Sinai. Um, just a little historical fact before we read, there are actually three locations for Mount Sinai, but this one seems to be talking about the middle one, which was what we would call today Temple Mount. Uh, if you go to Jerusalem today, I'm told I haven't been. But I'm told that if you ask for Zion, they'll take you to a peak outside the old city. And that was not what was used to build the original temple. And, and so uh, the imagery here, I think, is of that. Um, but it's referencing Moses, who is before David, who built, you know, uh, he didn't build the temple. His son Solomon built the temple, but made allowances for building the temple. He wasn't allowed because of his uh, warrior status to build the temple, but he prepared it and had all the uh, uh, designs and all uh, ready when it was time for Solomon. But, um, but the description here is at the time of Moses, which is centuries before. And so uh, it's an imagery Mount, Mount Sinai, uh, uh, Mount Zion is an image of, of where God's temple is, not a physical place. Now, Mount Sinai is a physical place, and it was where Moses went. Uh, I've, I've gotten that a bit confused in my speaking. I hope I can get it straight in time of reading. But Sinai is the place that's a physical place. It can be touched uh, they had physical experiences, not just Moses, but the people of God had physical experiences of God in lightning and storms and all. Uh, to prepare us from a historical point of view, uh, I want to read from Exodus 19 at verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. Pause there. He comes down to meet them. It's a halfway point. Have you ever known grandchildren that needed to be delivered and you meet the parents halfway? More or less, this is the imagery for God. It's, it's not God's home. It's not God's dwelling, it's a, ha it's a meeting place. And it's, it's that halfway location. It is uh, exalted in the sense that it's a mountain, it's, it's raised and height is used as being exalted in scripture. It's, it's a physical way of describing something exalted. And on that day, the Lord will come down on Sinai in front of all the people. Put limits for the people round the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not touch the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Pause there. Stoned or shot with arrows means killed at a distance. And there's an additional warning. Not a hand is to be laid on. Why do you kill them at a distance and not touch them? Because you too might become contaminated. This is... This is early primitive uh, avoiding contamination and, and don't lay a hand on. What are they contaminated? Well, they're not supposed to, to uh, be in the dwelling of God uninvited. God gives permission for some things and, and not for others. And just because you're offering it to God doesn't mean it's always accepted. The imagery in a few minutes will be of Cain and Abel. And uh, the sin of Cain was that he offered a sacrifice that was not accepted and got mad about it. But, but anyway, uh, we've got this don't approach the mountain, uh, don't, don't get involved in this contamination. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows, not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. Uh, skipping down to the 16th verse, on the day of the third, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with thick cloud over the mountains and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp. Now it says, everyone in the camp trembled 
and Moses led the people out of the camp. Did Moses tremble? Everyone in the camp, the, you're going to hear this, uh, Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like a smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God. Now that's Hebrew scripture, Exodus 19. And so now we read from Hebrews, New Testament 12, beginning at 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, and that is burning with fire, to darkness and gloom and storm. Now these are what we have not come to, remembering what Moses and the people of God did come to. We've not come to this. Uh, burning with fire, darkness, gloom, storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard them begged that no further word be spoken to them. Uh, I didn't read it, but there's an interesting verse in Exodus 20, uh, in verse 19. Uh, God is having all the people come up into the presence of God. This is after the trumpet blast. And next chapter at verse 19, the, uh, when, when it's said that God wants the people to come into his presence, remember that's always God's first choice, that we are in the presence of God. And uh, they're, they're given instruction to do so. But at verse 19, they say, uh, they, won't go. They, they won't go. You know, you go and you listen and then you come back. <laughs> And, and, and as it were, you be the spokesperson for God, but let us not go lest we surely die. You know, I mean, that, that's how scared they are. And again, Moses was part of that original group in the camp and they all trembled. They begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. Pause there. That's a quotation in theory, but it's leaving out a significant component of the quotation. Now, let me read you what I'm calling a, a, a quotation. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. What's being left out there? The original from Exodus says if even a man or animal. I think they're trying to stress the holiness of the situation. Uh, we know that people are sinners, but you don't typically think of a, you know, a lamb walking around or a, a, even a wolf walking around as being a sinner. And so the, the stress here is as how holy is it that even a wild animal couldn't accidentally walk on it and survive. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Now the closest resemblance of that verse is Deuteronomy 9, 19, where it's talking about Moses and fear. 22, but you have come to Mount Zion. And again, Zion in the physical is part of Jerusalem. There were three historical locations, but I think this one's talking about the middle location, which today we call Temple Mount. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. Now, again, this is God's dwelling place. This is not a halfway home, a halfway meeting pot place. This is home of God, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come down, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church. Now pause there. When I hear to the church, I think of a specific location. And because of the way things are in our society today, I typically think of a building place and the people that are members of a organization that meets in that building. First Methodist, First Baptist, First Presbyterian, or whatever. First whatever. I always wonder why there weren't that many churches named Sack. But anyway, that's just me. I think, but 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 the original in the Greek is ecclesia or ecclesia, depending on your pronunciation. The called out ones, the separated ones. What did we hear about the word holy last week, the week before? Holy to be set apart, to be to be reserved for God's own use. And so these are the called out ones, the ones separated, the ones set apart to the church of the firstborn 
whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Again, Cain gets jealous and kills Abel. And in Genesis, uh, God says, the voice of, of Abel is crying. He asks Cain, uh, where is your brother Abel? And, and Cain's response is, am I my, my, my brother's keep? God announces. So the blood of Abel represents murder. It represents the idea that uh, of the first two children recorded in scriptures having been born not created 50 percent of them five batting 500 they're murderers that's not a statistic that is easy to sit with it speaks a better word than the blood of abel see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks who's speaking god is speaking because god is the judge of all you come to god the judge of all do not refuse him who speaks if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth again that's a throwback to the image of mount sinai how much less Will we, if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven, Mount Zion? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The once more indicating the removal of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, there's my favorite word, kingdom. What kingdom is it? Kingdom of God. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Therefore, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably uh, with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Father, may the word of my mouth, the thought, the meditation, the heart of all here today be acceptable or in the name of Jesus become acceptable. You alone are our strength. Our we have the comparison, as it were, between uh, covenants between experiences of God and the obvious point is as great as Sinai was Mount Zion is so much better the one overarching theme about uh, yeah, the first is that uh, there's fear and sternness in Sinai there's this gloom darkness storm it's 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 a scary image of God such that even an innocent animal must be killed at a distance lest it infect you with its not being permitted to go to the mountain. I don't know how to express that. You've not come to that. Everything in that first section, 18, uh, 19, 20, um, 21, all of that is what we didn't come to. All right, the idea that we've come to it is past tense and current. In, in, in the Greek, it's present perfect. It's something we've already received and it's ongoing. But now we didn't receive, and it's not ongoing, Sinai. We do receive. It's the exact same verb in the Greek, but the first time it's not, and the second time it, it is. But you have come to Mount Zion. Now again, it's not a physical city. It's the city of the living God. But, but this idea of... of uh, Zion has been used in Hebrew Scripture and in New Testament. I want to read a few passages that I, I singled out. Joel chapter 2. You remember Joel 2 is, is what's quoted in Acts 2 about the, uh, uh, the day of Pentecost. Uh, but this is a section, uh, just verse 32, just, just one verse. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. Those are not two different places. That's a specific locale, if you were, a mount, and then the entire community. But poetry in Hebrew is often in parallel. You repeat, you say something, and then you repeat the exact same idea in a slightly different wording. And so, in, on, Mount Zion, on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem is an effort of poetry. Uh, so, deliverance. 
uh, Isaiah uh, 4 at verse 5, then the Lord will create over all Mount Zion and over all those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glowing of flaming fire by night. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy. There here God's glory is imaged as the fire and smoke that you saw leading the Israelites out in the uh, wilderness. And it's over as a canopy over the entire area, Mount Zion. From Revelation, New Testament, 14 and 1, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, stand Mount Zion. The Lamb is Jesus. Mount Zion is this spiritual locale. And with him, 144,000 who had his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. And then later in Revelation at 21, 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Skipping down to verse 5, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything. What does he not say? He doesn't say, I'm destroying everything. He doesn't say, I'm making a mess out of it. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and and true. One of the things that really upsets me about Christian theology is when uh, people get scared about the idea of Jesus returning. I remember my daughter as an elementary grade child coming home one day and, and, and saying in a very upset that she will never get to be a mom. And I asked her why. She said, well, because Jesus is coming before I'll be old as theorized that Jesus was coming. And she'd heard this I second or third grade in school, and, and it was used to terrify her. And oftentimes the image of the second coming is one of destruction. And so it, it's terrifying. But here in Revelation, it's I am making all things new. Now, what's Hebrews equivalent? Verse 27, the words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is, created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. That's not destruction. That's a changing. The closest equivalent, in my opinion, might be from 1 Corinthians 15, where Jesus is described uh, at work, and then the human is described afterwards, similar, and we're imaged as a seed. That which is sown corruptible is raised incorruptible. But the idea is that we must be sown. And if it happens that we die physical death before Jesus returns, our bodies are sown. That is, they're planted. Imagery there is as of a seed. I saw a graveyard one time. Uh, Seeds uh, planted in faith, just wait until we bloom, was the sign at the great seeds saints planted as seeds. Anyway, this imagery here is repetitive over Paul, over John, over Hebrews, giving you a slightly different view, but it's not a contradictory view. But you can understand why the idea of total destruction gets going, because it's shaken, and the created thing is shaken, so that what not what cannot be shaken may remain. I remind you of 1 Corinthians 3 when it's talking about the trial through fire. Uh, No foundation can be laid other than laid in Christ Jesus. Uh, The day will reveal it. The day is the day of judgment. Uh, Whether you build of wood, hay, stubble, that is that which can be burned up in fire, or whether you build a, a build of gold, silver, precious stone, the day will reveal. Uh, you will be tried as through fire. Now, if everything gets burned up, if you still have the foundation, you make it to heaven. It's very clear in that text that you make it to heaven. They may call you smoky for the first millennium, but you still make it. But this idea is that going through the fire reveals what's eternal. And that which is passing away fluffs off. It's like a seed. When you plant a seed and it germinates, the shell, the husk, falls away. Paul likes to use the imagery of the clothing. Put on the clothing or take off the clothing. Uh, Garments of righteousness versus, you know, 
other gone. Uh, one last imagery that comes to mind in looking at this passage is from First Thessalonians 4. I would not have you be ignorant, uh, brethren, about those who sleep. Do not grieve as do others, those without hope. For the Lord himself will descend, voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. Dead in Christ will rise. What I'm omitting there is they will Jesus spirits of those who have gone before. Now, whether it's spirit or soul, that which is eternal is in heaven. And in Revelation, uh, oh my goodness, where is that passage in Revelation? Um, it's early, I think it's like chapter 6, verse 10. The spirits uh, of the martyrs, those who are killed for the name of, are kept under the altar in the New Jerusalem. As I was telling someone the other day, imagine how crowded it's getting. More Christians are being killed today at point in human history, increasing rates. So they cry out from under the altar, how long? Which means, how much longer are we going to be stuck in here? It also means, equally means, you know, how long until you pronounce judgment on those who killed us. But uh, right now they're there, and in, in, in First Thessalonians 4 says, He brings with Him those who sleep in the Lord. These souls or these spirits come with God, and then the dead in Christ rise. So whatever is planted, sown corruptible, First Corinthians 15, sown corruptible, raised incorruptible, they join together with Jesus coming back. And there you have the culmination of of all that a person can be. You're complete at that point. It's at the second coming. But back in verse 23 at the end, you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Not to the bodies. The second coming hasn't happened, but the spirits are still there according to Revelation 6 and verse 10 under the altar crying out how long. And uh, these spirits, some scholars think, since the spirits are already there at the altar, get your timeline in your mind. One of the areas I have trouble. They're already there at the time of the writing of Hebrews. They could be Old Testament saints, the righteous of the Old Testament. To the righteous made perfect, are they Old Testament saints? Are they Christians who have already been martyred at the time of Hebrews was written. It's one of those things that it's open for interpretation when we get to heaven, we'll know fully. But at this point, it's just understanding that uh, that God, they are with God. Um, yesterday in Bible study, the question was asked about the thief on the cross uh, in Jesus's pronouncement, today you'll be with me in paradise. And I needed to explain to the paradise is the place of the dead. Luke 16, parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There's a chasm fixed, but they were inside of one another. You know, can't jump the chasm, but um, it's not a place of judge. It's the place of the dead. It's a resting place. Um, whether, according to First Peter, uh, Jesus went to the place of the dead and preached to the souls imprisoned there. Uh, did he go to hell as Episcopal uh, Confession, Apostles' Creed? Or, you know, that's it's not the word hell in the original. It's uh, Hena, a place of the song. Uh, God descends to the place of the dead. I mean, if I descend to the place of the dead, even there, God, you are. Told in the Gospels, hell was created for Satan. And I were never created for it. Not saying a person can't go there. It's just we weren't created for it. And it was us. Back to the text. Removing of what can be shaken, anything that falls away, so that what may not be shaken, shaken may remain. It's it's an appeal to, to hear God and to not refuse him. Verse 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Who's speaking? God. Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. And uh, it's given as a warning because there's a great shaking coming, but it's, it's a warning containing an appeal. Just listen to God. Just hear him. Hear him out. You'll be okay. Um, therefore, since we have received a kingdom, again, the idea of my favorite word in the Bible, God's kingdom, not mine, not yours, God's kingdom. It can't be shaken. It's permanent, eternal. Therefore, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. How would we worship God in ways unacceptable? Remember what I said earlier about uh, worshiping God in ways unacceptable 
and I mentioned um, did I mention to y'all the idea of strange fight back in uh, Hebrew scripture and, and this is an interesting study for another day if you if you want to understand uh, there were, uh, someone offered on the altar of God strange fire that is something God didn't authorize and and so this idea God can be worshipped in ways that it, that is unacceptable when David attempted to move the Ark of the Covenant down to Jerusalem the first time a guy named Uzzah is, is behind the cart they've got the uh, the Ark up on this wooden cart drawn by unbroken oxen where'd they get that idea well, they got it from pagans around they did so if first pagan church down the street does it that way we ought to do it the ark says i'm getting off hits a bump and starts to fall off the cart uzzah reaches up go ahead grant they kill god kills him you know the ark is saying i'm getting off here this is not the way i'm supposed i'm supposed to be carried on the backs of men that's why it had places for the poles, you know, holes for the, you know, and the rods fit in. And you got two sets of men, like you see today, carrying a, a cask image there. That, that is from Scripture. God's to be carried on the backs of men. And uh, David gets a bit ticked off. It's Nathan's threshing floor. And so he tells Nathan to, to uh, hold on to this thing. And then hears later that Nathan is blessed and everything is just going wonderful. And then he really wants to go and he does it right the second time. But he names the place Perez Uzzah, outburst against Uzzah is how he names that place that. Today's language, God went off outburst. He, he just went off on him, killed him, unauthorized. By the way, what is authorized? John 4, Jesus, woman at the well. But the day is coming and now is when God will be worshiped in his truth alternately we're in the spirit of truth authentic worship true worship here it's described as reverence and awe why why do we do this for our god is a consuming fire again that's the fire of first corinthians 3 at verse 13 where we're revealed by fire whether we build with wood hay stubble gold silver or precious it's also an image from deuteronomy 424 god is a cons- unholiness well, what is what does god tell mo when moses wants to see god no man shall see me and live Nobody, no one will see me. And so, you know, he puts him in the cleft of the rock and hides him with his hand. And as he's passing by and already gone, he withdraws. Moses sees, as it were, the backside of God. But don't anthropomorphize. He doesn't see God's bottom. He sees God as God is already fully packed. Um, I sort of ended up in the uh, second half of that quicker than I wanted to. Backing up a bit at verse 23, the firstborn to the church of the firstborn. I thought Jesus was the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn, but evidently he's going to share his firstborn status with all of the Jerusalem Bible, which is an interesting Catholic translate France to English from French. But it's got some nuances there that scholars really love. Everyone is a firstborn son. Everyone to the church of the firstborn. What What's special about a firstborn son in biblical time? Inherit what? The, right. the double portion. If there's five sons, it's divided into sixths, and the oldest boy gets two, and everybody else gets one, every other mate. Now, there was accommodation in Old Testament. Daughter, read that in Hebrew scripture where accommodate they would inherit so that their father. Um, we're all firstborn. I wonder if that means that we all are firstborn kid. You know, the- <laughs> <laughs> careful now. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, you have not come. You have come. It's a pilgrimage metaphor. We already are there. We're continuing to be there. But at the same time, at least as far as Zion is concerned, it's not really fully realized. And there's a tension there in the uh, Lord's Supper, as we have the liturgy uh, talks about uh, join with with all the uh, hosts of heaven. Uh, we join their unending hymn. We join worship. We don't start it. It's already going on. And this imagery here of you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels. Well, that's directly taken from Daniel 
7 at 10 talking about what it's like to be in the presence of God. There's ongoing worship. All right quiz time. Several times I have given my interpretation of the word worship for extra credit in heaven. What is worship? Doesn't mean you necessarily. It can. <laughs> Says the worship leader. <laughs> There's one word from English that sums up and it sounds like worship. It sounds like worth. Worth. W-O-R. When you worship, you are giving worth to God. Supreme worth. Because we're called to worship God supremely. And so what we're saying is, God, you are of most high value distance. You are first worth. And so you come to the thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Why in the world... They're so scared. It's it's fear and sternness in this first mountain at, at Sinai, but in in Zion there it's not, and 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 yet it's the greater of the two, and it's a living God who dwells there, and it's the thousands upon thousands of angels. Why is there not fear there? And that's a question I had yesterday, and rereading it today, it struck me that. Uh, to Jesus, verse 24, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We have our Lord Jesus. He takes, not, not took, but takes. He continues. He started and continues. That's that present, present perfect tense. Uh, he, uh, we don't have the mediator at Sinai. We just have the Father. Good point, exactly. And so, uh, again, in some ways, we've already realized this, and I was pointing out the uh, liturgy of the Eucharistic service. We joined the the, the thought is that any time we get into true worship of God, um, I don't know if you felt a, a special worship person or, or or some of church. It feels like something special has happened. That is worship. Uh, Solomon finally got to build the first temple. And they move worshiping God as supreme. The presence of God is so tangible that the priest cannot stand so as to minister. Word for glory in Hebrew scripture is kabod. Put an I in front of kabod, get the glory has departed. Ichabod. Literally, there are times I'll get focused on God and it'll and I'll feel a weightiness. I'm not saying I should seek out experience, but I'm aware that I am to worship being in God's presence and we're the gates of heaven. Malachi 4 talks about heaven pouring out a blessing. That's it, tithing, but tithing not in a legal sense that it's a better invest 90% of blood, 100 without the blessing of God. This is what happens when y'all leave me alone too long in, the, in this study. I just just go all over the place. All right, that's, uh, that's not the shortest I could have done, but it's the amount of time I did it in today. What are your thoughts, questions, comments? <laughs> <laughs> the Ten Commandments happen the second time uh, that Moses, Moses up. goes up. Uh, the first time he goes up, he carves them himself, and then he right. comes down. And they're sacrificing a golden calf. By the way, one of the books of the Old Testament, Sarana and the other books, there's parallel stories of the golden calf, more than one. And, and in one of them, they have named the calf yeah, the name of God. That's yeah, and, and said, you have delivered us from Israel. They, they're telling the, the golden calf. Moses grinds that calf up. But uh, the second time, go up to Mount Sinai. It's on the mountain that it happens. But the second time, God, by other thoughts? <laughs> with, with one exception. I think it helped. You know, the shaking has to do with a uh, uh, touch of... Uh, but again, the point is that's not going to last. If it's if it can be destroyed, it can it can waste away. And again, the idea back of the whole book of Hebrews is that perfect high blood is the perfect second. So we have better body or we'll close in prayer. Father, thank the word today is so very. Comp help us.